Uh, we're back. We're live here on a given Thursday at 9 a.m. here in Honolulu and Gauri Kandakar, who is in Brussels, and it's 9 p.m. on a Thursday in Brussels. She stayed up a little bit and she joins us now. Welcome to the show, Gauri. Thank you so much, Jay. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be on your show. <laughs> well, Gauri has, has a, an international awareness in the sense that she's a researcher at, uh, in the academic community in Brussels. Um, and she looks at um, international relations and the like for many years in one capacity or another. And uh, we want to talk to her today about uh, how, how things are doing in Europe over COVID, because Lord knows um, it fills the airways uh, here in Honolulu, it fills the airways in the United States. And it's very, very troubling um, because it's been politicized for reasons that are very hard to understand. But let's take a look at Europe. Let's find out how it's been going. Uh, I know there's been a surge there. And the question is, how serious is the surge? Uh, how are people reacting? And to what extent is it politicized uh, in Europe? So um, basically, when you step outside on the street, everything feels very, very normal. It's holiday season here. And, um, you know, every summer we pretend that uh, there's no COVID, it doesn't exist. So life goes back to normal, is what I mean. Uh, it's very funny, actually. But yeah, at least in Belgium. But in most countries as well, uh, there's no more mandate to wear the mask. Uh, that's also come about due to a lot of protests. But I mean, overall, people uh, have chosen to be vaccinated. And it's still going on, you know, the vaccination uh, rule. So around 58% of uh, Europeans are fully vaccinated, so double dose. And that's the latest data from this morning. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're doing quite well in, in that sense. And, you know, restaurants are open, um, people are on holidays. Uh, of course, um, you know, the, the, the numbers are going up because of the Delta variant. Uh, but still, life is quite normal here. It's returned to normal. How about you? Is it returned to normal for you? You have a young child. <laughs> you have to be a little concerned about going out. Yeah, personally, I'm really concerned. So I try not to step out too much, especially with the baby. Although most children are, you know, quite safe from 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 the virus. But I mean, you know, you hear stories. There was a story about a 12 year old boy in the US who passed away due to the Delta variant, unfortunately. So, but I still wear masks. I still wash my hands. And uh, yeah, whoever comes into my home, which is very little, we have this term in Belgium called cuddle contacts. Only those who are allowed to enter your home. And I still keep the rule, you know, and they must wear masks as well around uh, the baby, especially. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Each so I, have a, I have a user question for you. Actually, I have two. This is a viewer question. Um, okay, the first viewer question. How are Europeans, I suppose, uh, that's, that's Belgium, but it's other countries that you know of. Uh, how are Europeans dealing with the isolation issues? And have there been any studies of potentially uh, long-term mental and psychological problems because that's happening in the US. You know, there's very little done here. And I think the US might be a bit better at it. Uh, it's a, a really good question because I'm pretty sure there are a lot of people that are suffering from isolation, but also a fear of joining back the normal life. You know, once you've been staying in so much, then you have a bit of anxiety to get out. And that's not addressed here. I see it on Twitter, but on a European level, that is really not addressed, and it should be. That's an excellent question, actually. What I'm about not... what about the schools? Are the schools open? It's uh, you know it's uh, August, September. Um, we have to think about schools now. Um, you know, uh, are the kids in school? They're going back to school. Is there any uh, controversy over it, as there is in the U.S.? Not at all. Schools were open. They shut shut down for the holidays in uh, uh, July, I think. My baby's still not going to school, so. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, and they will open uh, as uh, early as possible, uh, and kids will go to school normally. 
um, there's not been any controversy to that extent. Also, because parents themselves were a bit frustrated having the kids at home and having to school, work while you know homeschooling them. Uh, so many people are very happy for the kids to go back to school. Huh. And and when the kids go to school, are they uh, are they wearing masks? Uh, are they practicing distancing in school? No, no, no masks, no distancing. I think uh, it's just that when somebody gets infected, uh, they have to do a test as well. You know, if there's a kid in school in a class who's infected, uh, the others need to do uh, a COVID test. Mm -hmm. And the COVID test now you can get them at pharmacies. It's a quick, rapid test done in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. and, and if the kid is found to have COVID, what happens? Then they quarantine for a, uh, a week, I think. The latest is seven days. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, in the US, um, you know, young children cannot get, I think it's 12 years old, they cannot get the, um, the vaccine and not supposed to be vaccine. Yes. Uh, is the same thing in, in Europe? Yes. So basically in Europe, uh, they're vaccinating adults. What I've read is in the UK, they've, um, they've offered it to 16, 17 year olds. Uh, and there was a bit of backlash from parents saying that, you know, they would need our consent and the government does not specify that. And just this morning, I read that the UK has opened it up to uh, kids as old as 12 years old. Mm -hmm. I have not seen amongst my friends any parents even con contemplating, you know, vaccinating their kids so far. Mm. But, uh, but now we know that, you know, even with the Delta variant, uh, you can catch it uh, even if you're vaccinated. Of course, it won't be as serious. But, you know, there are grandparents and kids transmit the virus. They don't necessarily fall very ill, touch wood, but they would, um, they would transmit it to at least the grandparents' parents. So for me, that's a concern. So um, uh, how bad is the surge? I mean, uh, the surge in the United States, which is largely political, yes. because uh, there are some states where people, uh, as a, you know, a general matter, won't take the vaccine, yes. um, uh, you know, where it's pretty serious and the hospitals are filled up and there's no uh, intensive care beds available and um, it's crisis, it's emergency. Um, and it's, it's very problematic, but I wonder if that's happening in Europe. So in Europe, um, there has been a decrease recently uh, after more than a month of increases in cases uh, because of the Delta variant, you know, uh, and these, um, the decrease has basically been um, uh, as a result of the decline in cases from Spain and the UK. So Spain uh, had really a lot of cases, uh, high level of cases uh, a month ago, and that was really threatening a lot of people's holidays, especially from the UK. People love to go to Spain. But um, now we see a bit of decrease, and that is, I think, also uh, going hand in hand with the increasing number of vaccinations. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but still, I mean, uh, and Spain was basically the uh, had the highest incidence of COVID in the EU recently. Um, and it's still marked dark red um, uh, by the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, uh, meaning, uh, you know, travel is discouraged uh, to Spain. Uh, but people are still going on holiday there. And I think uh, as more and more people are vaccinated, uh, it will ease up further. <laughs> Um, yeah, that raises another question that somebody has sent in, a viewer has sent in. How have some of the different countries been impacted by the various lockdowns and business restrictions? I guess he's asking about two things. You know, one is the, the pushback that you spoke about, you know, people reacting. But the other is, um, what about the economy? Um, you know, Europe is filled with small and medium-sized uh, businesses, mom and pop kinds of businesses. Uh, they must be suffering. So how, 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 is that work, how is that working in Europe now? Yeah, so um, we don't have a recession yet. But overall, I think uh, economy-wise, um, 
it's picking back up as because the industrial sector is coming back up. So what happened during the crisis was that we realized that the industrial value chains are so dependent on, you know, uh, third countries and we really didn't have the uh, capacity here to produce our own PP, PPs uh, and um, uh, and uh, uh, hand gel. Uh, so a lot of chemical companies, for instance, they converted their business to produce hand gel and other uh, medical requirements uh, because, you know, all trade, foreign trade had stopped. So that has also led to a rethink of how industry is structured here, how different that industrial value chains need to be shorter. And that has happened since 2020. So the restructuring has already started and that has helped, you know, kickstart the economy. There's also been a lot of sub, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, how do you say it? Uh, money injected to the economy due to the, uh, from, from the European Union. So not only is the um, uh, Green Deal, which you heard of, you know, the big package, which will help Europe become more resilient and to address climate change. Uh, but also there's the COVID recovery funds, which the EU is uh, distributing to its member states. And that goes to the economy, but also, you know, it has um, the goal to also make uh, various sectors of the economy or uh, climate uh, compatible, you know. So um, in that sense, uh, Europe is, Europe has been quite prudent and is, kind of making the small, taking small steps back to uh, where it was before uh, the pandemic started. But there have been lots of protests uh, also in France and there are currently uh, protests from unvaccinated people in uh, across various European states uh, to not make vaccines mandatory because here the rules are across various states now that, you know, you need a vaccine to go to a restaurant or to the cinema uh, and also to travel, et cetera. So um, not specifically for travel, but uh, at least to go to some restaurants. And people are challenging that. And there are big protests around, but not True. as big as, you know, they were <laughs> to lift the lockdowns. Mm, okay, well, that's, that's good to hear. Why, why are they protesting? I mean, what, what motivates them? Is it a um, is it a religious thing or is it a political thing? Is it a um, constitutional freedom thing? What is it? No, it's just anti-vaxxers. I think it is um, it, it, it's a common link across you know religions, cultures, etc. You find anti-vaxxers everywhere, uh, and anti-vaxxers don't want to get vaccinated, and they don't want the government to mandate vaccines or to make, you know, their life more difficult in that sense. You know, one thing you mentioned uh, that I want to uh, want to follow up on is, is that the EU has economic program assistance programs, sort of like the way uh, the US national government under Biden has economic assistance mm -hmm. programs. And um, that, that's a national thing. And in Europe, it sounds like it's the EU. Now we know you and I have talked about the the migrant issue. We've talked about some countries in Europe uh, yeah. having economic problems over the re recent years, um, where you know a given country is kind of in trouble economically. But now you speak about the EU doing things, and it strikes me, Gary, on a larger level, that COVID is bringing EU the EU countries closer together, because these are critical steps. They're economic steps. They involve um, a lot of money, I assume. Um, and so now the EU is taking a larger role in managing a larger problem, uh, which exists all around Europe. And, and this will continue. This will, this will be more the case going forward. Am I right? Yes. Um, so you really uh, made excellent points there. It's very true that the pandemic has brought European countries close. And the reason was because uh, prior to the pandemic, well, as soon as the pandemic broke down, each country started having its own, you know, uh, 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 policies to deal with it. And that didn't really work because we're, we're an area of free movement, you know, free movement of people, goods, etc, etc. 
So um, that doesn't work in, in an area like Schengen. Uh, and then the commission assumed, European commission assumed a bigger role uh, also in making sure that, you know, uh, national policies uh, were compatible, that, um, uh, that they also negotiated uh, at the European Commission uh, vaccine prices. Uh, so it has been the European Commission that's been negotiating, you know, a deal uh, with uh, the big pharma uh, for vaccines and they've got uh, competitive pricing. So it worked in that sense. Now, of course, you know, mega projects like uh, COVID recovery uh, are, um, are handled by the EU. Uh, because it's there's a thing called uh, uh, proportionality, which means that what works at the best level should uh, be used. You know, so here we see that the European level works best. That's why uh, the EU has been coordinating efforts and distributing uh, 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 money to its member states. What what is proportionality? What is it? What is it proportionate about? So, uh, sorry, I think I messed it up. It's subsidiarity. So the principle of subsidiarity, it means that, you know, uh, action should be taken at the level which is best pleased to. So for example, um, schools uh, or education, it, it can't be delegated by the European Union because, you know, it's a national policy because a nation uh, state can do it best. So French schools are uh, governed by, you know, French state. Uh, but, you know, when we have something like um, trade, you see that the EU level is best place. And in the same sense, to coordinate a Europe-wide recovery, but also, you know, um, travel policy, for example, uh, who comes in, into and goes out of Europe, you need a bit of a higher uh, vantage point and that's why the EU has been best placed. Also it negotiates better as a block so if you're it has a stronger position in negotiating prices because if you had all European countries negotiating individually um, that would have made it tougher uh, to get a better Covid price but in that sense uh, the EU has been better placed. But there's also been one other factor which has made the European Union response stronger is that the UK is no longer a member state. Uh, well, that tell me how that works. <laughs> so it's a good thing that the UK uh, took off, huh? Yes, because the UK has always had a lot of reservations in that sense. Um, they've all also been, uh, ironically, the member state that has implemented EU rules and regulations and uh, directives the best. But, um, but they, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of pushback over the years from the UK, and in that sense, they work. Um, it works better for the EU uh, at the moment because the other member states want a closer union. <laughs> well, to, to go back for a moment to proportionality, if I, if I am, if I'm able to get say 500 million doses of a yes. vaccine into the EU and negotiate a price, uh, the EU negotiates a price. Uh, who determines how much goes to each individual country um, and, and what is the distribution based on? Is it based on population? Is it based on need? Is it based on economics? Uh, and who decides that? Uh, because I, I think it's a very important question in terms of, um, you know, the EU stepping up and taking a role to make an equitable distribution. But on what do they base, you know, the proportions? Um, so funnily enough, and I've written a critique um, of this policy is that the EU had, like all other um, developed countries, you know, the US or uh, Japan, had purchased almost four times the amount of vaccines than their populations. There have been plenty of vaccines and uh, they were distributed uh, according to population size, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the fight was who got the doses first. But now it's it's panned out. It's it's quite okay at the moment. Because but earlier at one point we also had Hungary taking um, uh, the Russian vaccine uh, because so uh, you know Viktor Orban 
uh, is not very uh, so evil at the moment. So, uh, he, he's always going the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah. So he was not very really happy with the EU's dealing of the uh, of the vaccine uh, procurement. Um, you know, there were. I think we spoke about it during the last time. There was um, there was some challenges because uh, um, AstraZeneca promised vaccines, but they were not delivering. They were delivering more to the U UK, even though they had factories in Belgium. <laughs> so uh, at that point, you know, Hungary had lost faith. They bought uh, Russian vaccines, but now uh, it's all okay at the moment. There's enough vaccines. There's more than enough. <laughs> Is it free? If you wanted a vaccine, can you go down and get it free? Yes, it's free mm. in the mm. European Union. So, no, I something I don't understand, Gauri, is, is that only maybe three weeks ago, um, the Prime Minister of, of France, the President of France, Macron, um, you know, indicated he was going to um, do draconian things in order to require vaccines and masks and distancing. And he got a, a lot of pushback about it, but um, you know, people in this country, at least the people that I, that I'm on the left side of things. I'm not on the, obviously the right Trump side of things. But uh, <laughs> the, we we all thought that was a great idea because uh, you know, in the United States, we have trouble making people take the vaccine, and and yeah. of course, we know that if a large number of people don't get the vaccine, that infects everyone else. And, and we found that it even infects people who had the vaccine. And it also leads to the increased possibility of additional variants and all that. Yes. Um, so we were happy to see Macron do that. Um, but the picture you describe is, uh, it isn't necessary. Um, how do you feel about what Macron has done? Has he helped France or has he just created a controversy? No, no, it's, I, I didn't mean to say it's not necessary. It is necessary to get, from, from my perspective, 100% vaccination, you know? Uh, because, you know, you put other people at risk, you put yourself at risk, but also because of the variants, because the vaccines won't always, maybe not be resilient to all the different variants. You already have the Delta Plus in South Korea, you know? So, um, we're putting the entire society at risk. So what Emmanuel Macron has been doing, personally, I, I, I really like him and I like his policies and they've been quite progressive. Some have been regressive, uh, unquestionable, but you know, overall, at least in terms of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, he's been a strong president. Now, what he's doing is of course, like I mentioned, you know, uh, vaccines to go to restaurants, cinema, theater, uh, and what have you. Uh, but also he wanted to impose masks on the beach uh, in France. And I have friends traveling in France at the moment and uh, they're, not wearing uh, they're not wearing masks there on the beach. So I don't think- It gives you a funny suntan, a funny suntan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So what about what about other countries? I mean, are other countries following his lead? We, uh, a, I think that my this is my observation is that there was a big tumult um, about what Macron did for a few days after he did it, and then it was quiet. It's quiet in the news, and it's quiet now. So my assumption is that well, people people are essentially going along with it, and it's not nearly as controversial, and they have decided they might as well follow. You know, in France, uh, they might as well abide by his policies. It's okay. It's positive. As you say, he's, he's a well-respected leader for a lot of people. But what about other countries? Um, have, have they said, hmm, that's a good idea. We should do the same thing that Macron is doing. Has he demonstrated leadership within the EU? Well, he has demonstrated leadership within the EU in terms of getting various EU uh, initiatives uh, through, you know, uh, Germany and France are known as the engines of the European Union. So they push forward the big ticket deals like the uh, COVID recovery funds, the Green Deal, et cetera, et cetera. But for the moment, like I said, it's holiday season. There's very little going on in terms of, you know, uh, mm -hmm. restrictions, et cetera. And it's imposed less as well. Mm. Well, and, you know, in the old days, vacances, mm -hmm. 
that cons everybody moved all around Europe. And uh, yeah. I wonder uh, in the vacances this year, um, people are moving less, staying home, uh, concerned about going to other countries or limited, limited by regulation uh, to go to other countries. I mean, how has vacances been uh, uh, affected? <laughs> So, I don't have the statistics, but um, it, when you see the policies uh, across Europe, the lockdowns and restrictions started ending when it was time for vacations, like last year as well. So there's no difference from last year in that sense, you know. Uh, this year, the cases are comparatively less, you know. There's not an emergency. So last year, people started going on vacations, but then the country immediately became red on the European map, you know, COVID map. And then people had to go back home. This year is more relaxed because people are vaccinated. A lot of people are vaccinated. But, um, it's, it's quite, um, there's just a sense of normalcy around. That's uh, good. People are going on vacations. That's All good. of, yeah, well, I knew already went. And so, um, <laughs> What, what they've implemented is also the digital pass, uh, which you know shows you if you're vaccinated, if you have you have to take a test, et cetera, et cetera. So some countries have um, restrictions that you know you might uh, need to quarantine for a day or two if you're vaccinated or like ten days if you're non-vaccinated. But otherwise, it's um, and that's individual member state to member state level that's decided. So you have to go on the internet and find out the different rules in the different countries, eh? Indeed, indeed. It's been quite a bit of a hassle. So everybody has had to uh, do their own research and figure out what the individual rules are um, uh, uh, before they go uh, um, to another w European Wouldn't country. it be better if the EU handled that on a uniform basis? Yes, indeed. But again, that's subsidiarity. You know, the, the principle of subsidiarity is basically member states are best placed to decide what happens for their state mm -hmm. in that sense. Well, so um, I, I was going to ask you, what about the availability of medical care, of, of hospitalization, of, you know, intensive care units and all that? From what you say, it doesn't sound like it's a problem. In some places in the U.S., there are no beds. Uh, yes, is that, the, is that the case in Europe? Not really. There's not been any uh, red light emergency sounded, you know. Uh, I mean, Belgium has more ICU beds than, um, than India even. So there's well-equipped uh, medical uh, services in, across Europe. And for the moment, there's not uh, as many uh, deaths or uh, hospitalizations as during the height of COVID. Hmm, that's great. That's great. You've come a long way, and uh, yes. you, you know it's not like you're behind the curve. You're. It sounds in many ways like you're ahead of the curve vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, some places in the United States. Yeah. So here's here's my. I, I know your baby is calling for you. <laughs> so I only I only have one more question, Gary, and that is, you know, when you and I have talked in the past, we have often discussed the European reaction to uh, what is happening uh, across the water in the United States. And I wonder, you know, how people feel about, you know, the, um, not to use a, a Yiddish term, but uh, the churis, the trouble uh, that is happening in the United States. Uh, and it's all linked to the political trouble, isn't it? Um, so query, how do people feel about that in Europe? Because Europe sounds like it's well able to handle these issues. And they look across the water and they say, hmm, our poor cousins in the United States, they're having trouble handling. How do people feel about that? I think there is more confidence uh, at the moment in Europe vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US because of the Biden administration. So things seem more under control as compared to under the Trump administration. You know, and the cases were soaring. You had uh, so many deaths as well across uh, the US. Uh, I think it's reached what two two million cases in the US already. Uh, um, yeah, no, uh, six hundred thousand. Six hundred thousand deaths. Yeah, yeah. Uh, two million across the world. Sorry, uh, yeah. but that's still a high 
number you know uh, but now there's more confidence because the biden administration is there they you know it's just this kind of mental uh, uh, um, uh, stability uh, oh, sorry um, <laughs> is uh, it's a perspective issue i think yeah. although you know you mentioned there's various states that have their own tra- crises um but here we get a pretty more uh, stabilized picture of the us and so okay. moment, and, yeah and you talked about uh, travel about how it's a, it's a kind of lockdown a border I hate to use that term a border between europe and the rest of the world you know biden wants to require vaccinations for everybody traveling from anywhere outside the us and that's probably an okay uh, idea I, my own view is that everybody should have a vaccination unless specifically um you know excused by medical authorities um but what about the eu and other countries i mean you have um, developing countries around the world which have a very high rate of covid um and um they're not so efficient at handling it as the eu yeah. and i wonder what what is the border situation for example the migrants coming from uh, you know uh, the, the uh, middle east and the like uh, and central asia uh, and and for that matter india um, russia um, and so forth south america uh, how, what is the border like is is the eu excluding people so um Mm. there's for different countries have different uh, um systems these are with different countries you know um so when they come from a red zone they must take uh, a negative pcr covid test within 72 hours and then they don't need to uh, get tested or quarantine but it depends on from country to country again it's you know it's so hard to uh, give you a full picture for 28 different 27 different countries sorry no longer the uk but uh, for the moment is difficult for the moment. okay i know at the moment it's difficult because somebody is calling for your attention <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thank you thank you gary for joining us it's great to see you and i'll circle back and uh, you know we're going to do a similar uh, inquiry with uh, Rup Mani, you know your sister yeah. uh, in India. So I want to I want to compare the two between uh, your experience in Europe and hers in in India. Thank you so much, Gauri Kandakar, so our friend, our correspondent in Brussels. Aloha. Thank you so much, Jay. Pleasure. Aloha.